If you're a church sound tech and your band has gotten really big and there are a lot of elements on stage, how do you mix all of those together while keeping your levels reasonable so things don't get out of control? Today we're going to talk all about arrangement and techniques for keeping lots of inputs in check. Hey, if you're new here, my name is James and I help church sound techs, worship leaders, and tech directors eliminate the mystery and frustration around sound at church. If that's you and you wanna see more videos like this, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Mixing is an extension of the arrangement. We're just trying to put the right things in the right place so that everything plays its role into making music that sounds good. If things get out of control, it can turn into a soup sandwich and nobody wants that. For every great arrangement, there can be five ingredients, and not all of them are happening at the same time. But there's the foundation, there's the pad, there's the rhythm, there's the lead, and there's the fills. No more than four of these elements should be happening at any time, and you can actually get a really big sound with just three of these elements. As you add more and more instruments to your arrangement, each one has to take up a smaller sonic space to fit into one of these categories. The bass and the drums provide the rhythmic and harmonic foundation for everything else. The instruments that sustain for a long time and can kind of sit in the background but still fill things up is called the pad. This could be a guitar playing long whole notes, or a Rhodes, or an actual synth or string pad. The rhythm elements fill in between the downbeat and the backbeat and add more harmonic color. So this is your pianos and your guitars. The lead element in our worship services is typically the worship leader's vocal. Any other vocals singing along with them in a harmony part are still considered a lead as well, but you shouldn't confuse the melody and the harmony. Make sure that that harmony is tucked back behind the lead so that everybody can sing along. Finally, there are fills, and the fills happen when the lead is not. We don't want to be filling over the melody of the song. That's just going to get cluttery and draw too much attention somewhere else. But when the lead vocal takes a break and there's a short melodic thing that goes on in between there, that's a good thing. Let's take a look first at the foundation. So this is our drums and our bass. I'm going to solo these or actually mute everything else uh, using my DCA so that I'm just listening to this. The foundation of the foundation of the is, the is the relationship between the kick and the bass. When you've got a lot of instruments, these become kind of the launching point for everything over here and everything over here. So if you get this right, things are going to go well. So the relationship between the bass guitar and the kick drum has to be established for us to be able to launch everything else off of. So let's listen to that real quick. So you can have your bass be the lowest thing or the kick be the lowest thing. Doesn't matter to me what you choose, but one of them is going to have to be lower. So if we wanted the bass to be lower, we could move up the low band of our kick EQ and maybe move up our high pass filter a little bit more. Or if we wanted to go the other way, we could lower this a little bit and have the bass get a boost a little bit higher. So I've got a different EQ on here right now, but let's go to 110 and boost that a little bit. So that's one way that you can adjust that, you know, kick or bass is the bottom end on there. Then when we add in our snare, we want to make sure that the snare either is connected to the kick drum or separate from the kick drum. So rock is more connected, R&B, rap, it's more disconnected. What that means is that in uh, rock, you're going to have low end on the snare and top end on the kick. In R&B and rap, you're going to have no bottom end on the snare and no top end on the kick. So maybe we roll down the high pass filter a little bit on the snare and we boost a little bit more on the bottom end. All right, so now we can relate everything else with our toms and overheads to all the stuff that's going on here. So this is a drum break, so uh, we can go ahead and mute those. Now, when we think about the relationship between our bass and our guitars, the bass is the foundation for the rest of the stuff, and then our guitars happen over here. So we've got the foundation from the drums and the bass. Now we've got our rhythm section with the guitars and 
uh, and the keyboard a little bit, but the keyboard's also playing a pad roll as well. Let's listen to the keyboard real quick. So it's got pad and piano together. We can use our EQ and compression to kind of separate those two parts. So we could try to highlight more of the piano part by having a slow attack, letting that transient pop through. And if we make the release faster, we get the pad to come up faster as well. So that's fine by itself, but in context, when we listen to it with the guitars, you can hear a difference too when we compress it that way. So that's one way that we can adjust the balance there of the rhythmic and pad elements inside the keyboard. In all the guitars, unmute the acoustic guitar too, these are all of our rhythm elements. So we have to think about the way that these are relating to one another. But then the link here is the bass. So if we have the bass up and proper, and then we mix our guitars into that, our guitars can feel thinner by themselves. And then we can also make space like one guitar is filling up one part of the frequency spectrum while we leave other room for the other electric guitar in that part of the frequency spectrum. Let's look at the EQ that I've got on this guitar. 318 and 630 is what I'm cutting. 1.4K is left alone. On the other guitar, what have I done here? I've left a little bit more of the low mids there and I'm still cutting 630. So let's play around with bypassing the EQ, just use, listening to the electric guitars and see what those are doing. These frequencies are my go-to frequencies. They're not the only frequencies you can do, but they tend to do well. And you can find more about that in my live mixing field guide. I detail all the stuff that I like to do in these guitars. But let's just bypass the EQ on both of them and then see how the EQ makes them get a little bit more space for one another. All right, this is EQ off and EQ on. So they've retained their essence, but we've gotten rid of a little of the stuff that's not essential. Now let's listen to that with the keys added in. So because our keyboard has gotten a little bit of pop on those transients and our guitars have pulled out a little bit of stuff with the EQ, now there's room for everybody in that mid-range section that's going to make more room for our vocals. So then our vocals don't have to be way out in front of everything else. Now let's listen to the bass with all of it and make sure that our low end is right. Feeling good there. Now the relationship between the bass and the rest of the drums is gonna become uh, more critical. We can tell that we're gonna be in a good spot there when we unmute those. Sweet. So I'm pretty happy with the way that all this is coming together. Each thing is playing its own role in the arrangement. We've identified what that role is. And then two instruments that are kind of playing in the same role or different parts of the same role, we're making room for them with EQ or room for them in the time domain with compression. So hopefully that helps you sort out what it is that we're doing when we're approaching a mix that's got more instruments and a lot going on. 
As you learn to categorize and put each instrument coming from on stage into the elements of your arrangement, then you can start to have a conversation with your worship leader about which instrument is primary. When there's more than one rhythm instrument, you can pick one that kind of dominates that space, and you just ask yourself, if there was no other instruments, which one would accompany this song the best? When you have clarity on that, then the other instruments can play a backseat role to that primary rhythm instrument. Hopefully these secondary instruments are playing in a different frequency range or a different rhythmic pattern than the primary instrument. Other times these instruments switch playing roles and go from playing rhythm to playing fills in between the lyrical lines. Now that we know what role the instruments are playing and which one gets priority, there's another tool that can really help lock your arrangement into place, and that's compression. Compression can help you with control of your different instruments so that one doesn't jump out all of a sudden when somebody gets a little more excited or digs in a little bit harder on their instrument, but it also can help tame the size of different instruments. When you have a lot of different elements, each one has to take up a smaller amount of space, and compression can help kind of reduce the size sonically for that instrument. We can set up our compressor to make things sound bigger and fatter, or we can make them sound smaller and tighter. This is one of the feeling things that's the intersection of a topology and an electronic circuit that meets a feeling in music that's really exciting for me, and hopefully you get to dive in and figure out some more of that and explore the world of compression and what it does. Another element that helps you fit a lot of different instruments into a big mix without it getting too loud is differences in tone and timing. For instance, when you think of a country piano sound, it's usually bright and pretty tacky to fit in the dense mix of a bunch of different guitars too. You're only needing the brief transient of that piano note to jump out and let you know, oh, there's the piano notes, it's playing its thing, and then it's getting out of the way. This is in contrast to a big grand piano sound that has a lot more sustain and harmonic richness that hangs on. Though we'd love to get everything right at the source, sometimes we have to make those changes at the soundboard instead. A lot of worship leaders that are used to accompanying themselves like a softer, fuller, mellower piano sound. But in a big mix with a bunch of different instruments, you might have to tailor that to get a little bit more brighter and tacky in order to just stick out and get those moments ready so that it's still part of the mix, it's still part of the arrangement, but it's not taking up all that sonic space. So here we're just gonna listen to the rhythm instruments. We're not listening to the bass. We're just listening to the acoustic guitar, two electric guitars, and a keyboard. And the keyboard actually has a pad with it as well. And so I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna make the keyboard pop a little bit and how you can use your EQ and compression to shape sounds that are sent to you to make them fit a little bit more in a dense mix. So this is an example of lots of things going on in the mid-range. Both guitars are stereo, keyboard stereo, and I wish there was keyboard and pad, but we're not sent that. Uh, we have both of them together. So the A, B function here is really helpful for demonstrating this. When it's lit up, it's on B. When it's on, when it's unlit, it's on A. On our A section, right? So if we look at the EQ, we've not boosted anything in the top end. We've taken care of some mid-range stuff. On the compressor, take a look, and we've got a faster attack and, you know, a medium release. And we've used our makeup gain so that the levels are matched between A and B. On B, you can see on the compression, the attack time has gone down to 32 milliseconds. So we're trying to get that initial attack of the piano keys hitting to come through a little bit. Uh, release is about the same makeup gain. Again, we're trying to level match it so that we're not hearing big level differences and thinking, ooh, that's better. We're trying to get it to fit better within the same relative or perceived level. The other big thing on this uh, B setting is the EQ. I've added a high shelf and boosted that up. As I'm thinking about it, I'm just going to roll down this frequency a little bit more try to capture a little bit more of that percussiveness as well. So I'm gonna play this, we're gonna to listen to it on A first, see how the piano and pad kind of fit in there, and then what it's like when I switch it over to the B setting. And maybe I'll let you hear the piano by itself real quick. And maybe I'll just bypass the EQ and compression altogether to start as well. So no EQ and compression, this is what the piano sounds like. Adding the EQ. It's a little bit cleaner in the mid-range. And adding the compression. Now let's listen to it with the rest of the instruments. Now let's 
to switch over to the B7. So it's not that it comes up in level, it just has a little bit more apparent space because of how bright we're making it and the way that we're compressing it differently. Now admittedly on the A setting, this attack time is going to take out more of that uh, initial attack that it has, which is not helpful. So the, the way that we're choosing our attack time is allowing it to pop through a little bit in the mix and we're giving it that brightness so that it, it sits there. It doesn't necessarily have to be louder in order to be unburied. Another thing that can help create space is a call and response type rhythm, where maybe the acoustic guitar plays on beats one and two, and the electric guitar plays on beats three and four. Other times, some elements need to be there just enough to give a feeling to the mix, where they're more conspicuous in their absence than in their presence. In the loud sections of a big mix, the acoustic guitar usually fills this role for me. I want it to be like a shaker with chords. I don't need it to be way out in front or on top of everything else, but if it's totally gone, then we're missing some of that low-level movement that gives it a little bit more energy. If you listen to Christian radio at all, you're very likely to hear a tambourine coming in the chorus. It's an inexpensive way to add a lot of space in a recording. Now, I don't recommend having tambourines live unless you've got a drum cage or maybe just an electronic version of it, but tambourines can get into every single mic, so that's kind of a pain for me. One problem that some people run into when they've got a lot of different elements on stage is what I call ratcheting. You push up an input till you can hear it, then you push up another input until you can hear it. Let's say you got the piano, then you push up the guitar. Now you push up your second guitar and your third guitar, and now your pads, and suddenly you can't hear the piano anymore. So now you push up the piano. So now you can't hear the other guitar. Guitar one goes up, and you keep going up and up and up until now things are too loud. It's all cluttery and it's a, a big mess. So one way to avoid ratcheting is again, identify your primary instrument and then turn up things till you can hear them and then pull them back just a little bit. This way your ear has identified them and you can see how they're playing a supporting role with other instruments. Another tip for this is to not listen to inputs with solo mode. Now, I understand that it's a benefit to be able to hear something to know what you're trying to identify, say in the headphones, before you push the fader up so you don't accidentally push up, say, the click track or the guide track without knowing it, because that's a little embarrassing. But when you listen to things in solo or in headphones, you can make that sound really nice and big, but not in context to everything else. Remember, the more inputs we have, the smaller they have to sound. Not using solo mode helps you to listen to what something sounds like in the context of everything else. Another tool on the console that helps a whole lot are DCAs, or digitally controlled amplifiers. These are remote controls for your faders, or a group of faders, so that you can bring everything down just a little bit, or everything up, to help it fit in its place in the arrangement. A lot of times after I get my basic mixing done on say the drums or a group of guitars, I'll just leave all the rest of the level changes for the DCA so that I can put those in the right spot and kind of feel where they need to be in the mix. In addition to individual groups of instruments, you can also assign them to the entire band or all the instruments minus the drums or whatever other combination you think fits well for what you're trying to do. Maybe you have drums, bass, and all the rest of the instruments, and then all the rest of the instruments grouped out as well with guitars and keyboards. You can dual assign different channels to different DCAs and your channel's fader level will be a combination of all the different DCA settings that you have assigned to that channel. One thing I find myself doing a lot is because I like a lot of input channel compression, that actually takes away more dynamic range than I need for the overall mix. So sometimes I will actually pull down the DCAs for the instruments when the drums and the bass drop out so that it actually comes down and we get a more gentle moment in that live environment. Then when things ramp back up and the drums and bass come in, I can push up those DCA faders for my guitars and keyboards, and now everything is in your face again. One thing that I don't recommend doing when things get too loud is pulling back the level of the master fader. And this is why I love DCAs. I'll explain it in just a second. When you pull down the master fader, you're getting a lower level of everything at the same level. So your drums and your bass are coming down at the same level as your guitars and your keyboards. While it seems like that might be a good solution, it's only a great solution on paper because of the way that our ears perceive different frequencies at different levels. As we pull the overall level back, 
our ears will perceive less low frequencies than middle and high frequencies. So even though all the level relationships are the same, our perception of the low frequencies has now changed. That's why I like to have my drums and my bass on a separate DCA, and I can pull down just the instruments by themselves. If things are too loud, I might also need to pull down the level of the drums and the bass, but I'm gonna do that carefully so that I don't lose all the energy from my mix. If your sound volunteers at church can handle a little bit more complexity, you could consider using groups and compression on those groups to try to tame the levels of things that might get out of balance and to keep things from getting too big too fast. When you group different types of inputs together and put a compressor on that group, when you push up one individual channel, that's going to push down the compression on just that group and not everything else. This can be a safety net of sorts, so that nothing suddenly gets way too loud, and it can also be a different way to have some more creative control over the tonality of your overall mix. You can use a combination of DCAs and the group output faders to change the level of compression or the amount of compression that you're getting on all of these groups and keep the overall levels the same. To do this, you can assign a DCA to all of your input channels and another DCA to all of your output channels or all of your groups. Now, my console here in the studio doesn't allow me to assign an output to a DCA, but I'll show you how you can set it up with the user layer in just a second. As you push up the input channels and pull down the output channels, you're essentially lowering the threshold and getting more compression and getting more in-your-face type sound. As you lower the input channels and raise the level of the outputs, you're essentially raising the threshold on your compressors. So now you're getting less compression and things can move a little bit more and it's less tight, but a little bit more dynamic internally. All of this can happen without changing the overall level and it's a fascinating thing to do. All right, to demonstrate this, I've got my mix up, and this is my, what my normal front house mix would look like, just all my input channels, but I've created a user layer, which makes all these stereo channels compressed down a little bit. So it's a lot less space over here. That kind of helps my brain keep things tidy. But over here on the right side, I've got my band DCA. So this controls the level of all the band faders on the input side. And then I've got my subgroup. So if I go over here and show you on my kick drum, you can see it's not assigned to the main, but it is assigned to the subgroup. And the subgroup, I've assigned it to drums. My bass, I've assigned to the bass group. My instruments, I've assigned to the instrument group. So those are all showing up over here, which I put them in a better order because, you know, this one's an odd one on the bass group, but I want it right next to my drums. I digress. So we've got our band, drum. So these are inputs, but these are output channels. So if I want more compression, I push this up and pull this back and I get no change in overall level and I can still fine tune the drums instruments bass levels between them. And then if I want less compression overall, I can pull this back and push those up. And that's essentially lowering the threshold. So let's listen to it and see what it's like, because this is a lot of fun. So with just moves of a couple faders, I can totally change the way my mix feels with the amount that it's compressing in groups and make those adjustments on the fly for whatever the song feels like it needs. And I'm also mixing into compression. So if I push up something for a guitar solo, something needs to come up a lot, it's just going to push down the other instruments in that group and make it fatter. So lots of fun stuff there. Two more things to think about if you're going to try this is that my opinion, group compression needs to be a little bit gentler than input channel compression. 1 to 3 dB can be a whole lot of group compression, whereas you can get 5 to 10 dB on input channels and it's no problem. Another opinion of mine is that lower ratios work really well on groups. So going 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 can feel really big. My final caveat on this is that as you increase the amount of compression that you're getting, you're also raising the noise floor. So watch out if your inputs are feedback prone so that you don't get yourself into a pinch. 
If you're new to compression and don't understand what all of it does, but you want to dive deeper and take your mixing skills to the next level, I'd highly encourage you to check out Attaway Audio Academy and the Mixing Foundations course. The lessons there will walk you through all the different steps for building a mix from the ground up, from gain structure and balance, EQ and compression, and adding effects to your mix to make things feel awesome. When you hear your mixes improve because you understand the tools better and you know how to put it into practice, you'll really thank yourself for making that investment. You can find more information about Attaway Audio Academy through the link down in the description below. If you like this video, go ahead and mash that thumbs up, share it with a friend, and hit the subscribe button. As always, remember, it's all about the low end, avoid the sound tech solo, and nobody leaves church humming the kick drum. We'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.